in St. Louis. It's every man for himself. It's like Iraq over here. <laughs> Shells flying every day. Just cut those. You call our police janitors out here. They just clean up the dead bodies. The Prime Offenders, the Boys of Destruction, or BOD. They'll kill just for fun. Ice, stabbers, guns. They don't want money. They don't want fame. They just want to hurt something. These cats now, they kill at the drop of a head and jack you in a minute. BOD is on and popping. Anytime, anywhere. The person closest to you can kill you. St. Louis, Missouri, sits on the banks of the mighty Mississippi River. Its famed Gateway Arch marks the symbolic entrance to the American West. St. Louis isn't large, ranking 52nd among U.S. cities in size. But its murder rate is among the highest in America. And on its northwest side, gang warfare is common. We have a high murder rate for this, for this city. So somebody's always trying some monkey shit all the time. Somebody gets f***ed up, somebody gets killed, somebody gets shot. Anything can happen. This is, this is the inner city of St. Louis. You can get killed by your own friend down here. There ain't no such thing as a friend down here. You got a family and you got who you grew up with. That's about it. There are as many as 10,000 gangbangers in St. Louis, which is one in every 35 people. The bloodiest conflicts among gangs are those between rival factions, where red battles blue and the dividing lines are drawn. In the 314, that line is Martin Luther King Drive. It's like the line you don't cross. If you go into his backyard, then you in enemy territory. He come across that into your backyard. They in enemy territory. The Southwest Side belongs to the Boys of Destruction, or BOD. The Boys of Destruction were probably the most organized and deadliest group that was out there. We the BOD, we the Boys of Destruction. We destructed everything we touched. Piper asked to have his identity concealed. A BOD since the early 1980s, he's one of the gang's founding members and a respected leader. He describes a childhood scarred by gang violence. I went through a lot of changes and things that I, I don't think I would have went through as a regular kid and be into a gang and changed to fights, stabbings, guns. Piper knows firsthand how powerful the allure of gang life can be. You got guys that will shoot, rob, they, they'll do anything just to be down and try to seem like they're cool. Or they'll do anything possible, you imagine, to be down with you. The BOD's fiercest rival, the Horseshoe Posse, runs the northeast side of MLK Drive. Has it always been the Horseshoe? For years, this, this this goes back over 30 years, so it always been this, even before. You know what I mean? In bigger cities, there are places to hide from your enemies. That's not the case in the Lou. St. Louis, your enemy is right across the alley. They don't need no car. All they have to do is get the guns and bullets and walk around the corner. Our town is smaller. All the players know each other. It's like you like you can't. F over me, and I'm not see you, was for sure. We, we'll see you again, we'll bump heads again. That's what makes it real dangerous. Sanchez Smotherman, known as Psych, is a leader in the Horseshoe Posse. I've been questioned for murders. I got a reputation for being a tough guy for setting examples on people who thought I did play. Like when the dog go piss on the tree, he leaves his scent right there. So I was infamous for leaving my mark. Dead man's on, man. What's coming around here playing? 
If <laughs> you get killed around, you won't make it out of here. Sanchez was the major figure in Horseshoe Posse. He was the one of um, the Horseshoe Pushers. People that represent their block real tough, and they, they do whatever they have to do for their block. People know that he's from the Horseshoe. Them guys you shouldn't mess with. The Horseshoe is a loop formed by three one-way streets. Posse goes back to the cowboy days. I mean, like when they ride in town, they get the posse's coming. So for the simple fact that, you know, our street is shaped like a horseshoe, it's a group of dudes standing around his neighborhood and just stick the two together. But to unwelcome visitors, it's a dead end, especially for the boys of destruction. In this ruthless environment, the top dogs are known to all. The most notorious member of BOD, Dorsey Brandon, known simply by his first name. Most gang members use an alias on the streets to conceal their identity from police. Dorsey didn't deem it necessary to hide. Dorsey would admit it. You know what I do. I, I can hear him saying that now. You know what I do. I just ain't doing it now. <laughs> Dorsey's reputation for lawless brutality has made him a legend in St. Louis. Dorsey will be because of his propensity for violence. You know, his nature, his, his temper. He, it was short. He had a real quick fuse. Dorsey's life was always violent. He was 14 when he was shot for the first time. A couple months after that, when he was still healing up, the police called him on the corner and they stomped him and they dug their fingers in the holes in his chest and all that. He was not no egotistic person. He was just being himself. You know, you got some guys looking, you know, that like the glory and the fame. And uh, I want this image. And he was just being playing over himself. Raymond Dixon, AKA Rainbow, is Dorsey's brother. The nickname came from the colorful striped shirts he liked to wear. Now he wears prison gray, thanks to the BODs. You know, I couldn't be nothing but in the midst of things. You know, this is my family. At six foot three, Dorsey towered over everyone, not just because he was tall. He was pick you up and slam you like, you know, get on, it's over with. And, you know, not to glorify it, but that was just, that was him, you know? To me, he was the craziest dude alive. But he all, but he took care of everybody. Because he made us who we was. He was extreme, but to him, it probably look, I'm, I'm protecting my loved ones. When Dorsey was hit, he would hit back. And it took one burst of gunfire for him to declare war on the Horseshoe Posse. October 1991. It was a warm night, and Dorsey was hanging out on a friend's front porch just a few blocks from the rival gang's turf. Suddenly, a car pulled up, and two men with 9 millimeters opened fire. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time, on the wrong block. There ain't no telling what, what Dorsey gave them before that. Dorsey dove into his car as the shooter sprayed the vehicle with bullets. He was hit seven times in the chest. Prayers went out, hoping he, you know, we don't lose him. Dorsey survived, barely. It could have been just another drive-by shooting on the streets of St. Louis. Except for one thing, the shooters picked the wrong target. He was well known for using his weapon. He was a pretty um, quick with his gun and, and anger. Yeah, he had a temper. I didn't see him give many people passes when, you know, he had them down bad. Like, 
Don't let them go. Dorsey didn't know who had pulled the trigger, but he was ready to take out any Horseshoe Posse members he saw. The violence had escalated to an epidemic portion, and that's when everything exploded. Just the city was in chaos. It was crazy. People started going to jail, people started getting killed. St. Louis. It's known as the Hustle City, the STL. The name comes from the criminal hustlers who call it home, including a violent gang known as the Boys of Destruction, or BOD. Anybody can get it. Anybody is there, anybody, everybody. Ain't no yeah. exclusion. Right. Ain't no kids excluded, women. If you get caught in the middle of that, that's yeah. just it. Man, we ain't got a high murder rate for nothing. Do not, I repeat, do not come down here with that monkey shit, man. Your ass gonna leave out of here. St. Louis used to be one of the shining jewels in the United States and was host to the 1904 Olympic Games. In the early part of the 20th century, St. Louis was one of the busiest ports on the Mississippi and the fourth largest city in the U.S. So prominent that it also hosted the World's Fair. As the city boomed, so did violent gangs. Uh, we had the Roach Guards and the Pug Uglies. And um, those were German and uh, um, um, Polish uh, gangs. And kind of strange, they identify, identify with the red and blue, too. There were also the Pillow Gang and Egan's Rats. These gangs held up dozens of banks in the early 20s, getting away with as much as $4 million. The proceeds paid for weapons that led to open gun battles in the streets of St. Louis. Following World War II, families left the inner city. Industries left, and the economy dried up. We had tons of uh, a manufacturing places, many places where people could make an honest, good buck and survive and pay house notes and buy cars and so on. But those industries dried up, and um, many who had those jobs kind of moved towards another community. The gateway city that once boasted 800,000 people now held just 350,000. So we've lost over 60% of my population. The middle class is gone. The loss of population, it, it created an environment that builds and cultivates the crime. The downtown area was hit especially hard as neighborhoods descended into poverty and drugs. Around the uh, mid-70s, that was the introduction of uh, heroin to our community. And when those guys began to distribute heroin, then the decline of the community really started. Dorsey Brandon was born into this chaotic environment in 1973. He was barely a teen in the mid-1980s when he joined a crew called the Boys of Destruction. In the beginning, the BODs were breakdancers, whose only battles were about who broke the hardest. Piper, a BOD member, was one of Dorsey's best friends. Yeah, it was a competition. It was real competitive because the best breakdancers had the girls, and you walk around with your big boom boxes and, and ride through the neighborhood and just do your thing when you get there. You go and have a dance competition. I mean, it's like spinning on your heads and who can who can do the best hip hop dances and stuff. And then, you know, everybody said, we're the best, we're the best, and they growling about it. BOD sometimes took on other meanings. Brothers over death. At one time, they were saying brothers of Dorsey. You know, it get personal with certain individuals. The BODs often battled the Horseshoe Posse. The two gangs attended the same grade schools and played in the same parks. We all click clack together, so to speak. It's 
like a bullet going into the shell. It fits, everything fits together, and you heard the sound. That's everything's together. Despite the occasional fist fight, the gang showed each other respect. You just go to the same clubs together, you know. Everybody was a social. It was, it was good, you know. We stood it out. We stuck together. The BOD's leader, Dorsey, wanted more. He wasn't satisfied with just running a breaking crew. He was always the neighborhood bad guy. He, he pretty much made other guys tough guys, too. And Dorsey Brandon was a kid that uh, developed into a very violent kid. He uh, was known for being a hot boy. He was respectful to the police, but he would cause havoc on the street with the citizens and uh, other rival gang members. You know, he, he could be notorious uh, with uh, enemy gang members. By 1986, Dorsey saw an opportunity to start making green. The country's crack cocaine epidemic had hit the 314 hard, and Dorsey led his crew into the drug dealing business. Almost immediately, they started living up to their destructive name. The boys of the destruction at that time were clearly very organized and very deadly, and they were very violent. You got people that usually didn't have nothing growing up, but when the crack came, they had something. So it through, it kind of put an unbalance in everything, and everything just went chaos. Dorsey's younger brother, Rainbow, was happy to follow his brother's lead. There from day one, you know, I just wanted to follow in my brother's footsteps. BOD soon began to attract national attention. The super gangs in L.A. started keeping tabs on St. Louis as the drug business there became more profitable. Say, for instance, California, a kilo of cocaine was going for 12000 By coming to St. Louis, you can automate that same kilo's worth 30000 The L.A. gangs wanted a piece of the action. Then, street by street, they supplied drugs to the locals who ruled those corners, including the B.O.D., this new gang culture exploded in April 1988 when the gang banging movie Colors hit theaters. Its depiction of LA's warring Crips and Bloods inspired local gangs to take up sides. It hit St. Louis like a windstorm, a snowstorm, a blizzard out of nowhere. Overnight, different neighborhood groups that already existed were adopting Crip and Blood identities everybody trying to claim and be the man everybody want to be the toughest gang member crippling blood that it was and stuff just got crazy bod and the horseshoe posse decided to be bloods until dorsey discovered he didn't have enough enemies Everybody being bloods, that mean everybody was cool with each other. But Dorsey, he didn't want to be cool with everybody. He wanted to be able to have some action. So Dorsey defected to the Crips and took the BODs with him. Case was like one of the first really Crip sets out around that time. And it's like the whole West Side's majority bloods around it so of course we're gonna be the main targets the BODs began affiliating with a citywide network of gangs they soon had allies all over st. Louis instead of just relying on the 30 40 people or 10 15 people that may be in your immediate gang if your connections are right you now have access to over a hundred people BOD ruled with an iron fist. They would never try to stop the BODs from coming in because the BODs would come anyway. And believe me, the, uh, the boys of destruction were in charge. Their rivals were right across King Drive, the Horseshoe Posse. 
with just four lanes of asphalt separating them, battle was inevitable. One side, the horseshoe being bloods and the BLDs being crisp, naturally they had conflict. Then with the crip and bloods, you had family members and people that was really close at one time. Probably used to walk over their person's house as a kid and play with them. But with the color thing, they broke all it up. They were now sworn enemies. Rico Boyd, who was born in the neighborhood, describes the rivalry as life and death. If you was caught on the other side, you better have your pistol. Or you better know how to run, one or the other. Dorsey became the undisputed leader of BOD, while his equal in the horseshoe posse was a gangster named Hitman T. And Hitman T was bent on uh, being, um, being as big of a rival as Darcy was. And so that means the borders would clash. And it was war against the boys of destruction. The two biggest gangsters in town had a wary respect for one another. Darcy and Hitman T, they had run-ins with each other, but it was always, they just clapping at each other. They're going to shoot at each other and that'd be that. But neither one of them really actually did any damage to each other. But they did damage to a whole lot of other people. Then, in March 1991, Hitman T was caught in enemy territory with nothing but a can of spray paint. He got caught one morning spray painting and uh, some guys drug him in his alley. But he can only fight him so long until somebody came running down the alley with a shotgun. And uh, they shotgunned him. Hitman T's funeral almost became a riot when the angry gangs confronted each other. Police quickly stepped in and broke up the fight, but tensions remained high. The ultimate disrespect occurred after the funeral, when Dorsey is said to have dug up his rival's body. He pried the casket open, put the body in the car with a smell like that, drive it over to the mother's house and throw it on the porch, all that. I really can't confirm that. That could be a touchy, a touchy subject for somebody in this man family. Dorsey and the BODs were now firmly on top. The streets of St. Louis were running with blood, and no end was in sight. You got some guys that just, they just love the action. They don't want money, they don't want the fame. They just want to hurt something. St. Louis, gateway to the West, and home to thousands of gangbangers. Our area is more dangerous because the poverty level is so high. The shootings, the murders, the gang activity, I mean, that all goes with that. People get hurt. The city's most notorious gang is the Boys of Destruction. When members of the Boys of Destruction went places, people knew who they were and they were afforded the fear. Because if you mess with them, you were messing with a violent entity. If you get caught in the middle of that, that's just it. BOD have a thriving drug trade, pushing everything from marijuana to crack. Uh, dope, crack cocaine, heroin, teas and blues, stuff like that, you know, on the streets of the cities of St. Louis. And uh, it was pretty rampant. The secret to their success is keeping the cash separate from the killing. The man who controls the money controls the BODs and stays clear of law enforcement. The shooters stay out of the money game as long as they get paid. Pretty much whoever controls the drug market controls everything. People upon him gonna protect him to make sure that they eat. The shooters often come in the form of young gang prospects who are trying to make a name for themselves. You got guys that will shoot. Rob, they, they'll do anything just to be down and try to seem like they're cool. You got your crash says dummies. You want them to go shoot a guy around the corner, he'll go do it. He's pretty much a dummy because he's not getting out of the situation, but getting used.
the crash test dummies pretty much always just end up crashed. We stop a car, and the youngest individual, he's the one that's going to claim ownership to the gun. And he's willing to do and sacrifice his own life or his own freedom for the game. The boys of destruction wear blue. Their arch rivals, the Horseshoe Posse, wear red. The tradition started in 1988 after the movie Colors brought the thug life into the mainstream. The writing on the walls marks each gang's territory. The graffiti is like the ghetto newspaper. It tells people what's going on, who's shooting who. If I put BLD on the wall and I put a K behind it, that means I'm a BLD killer. If I put horseshoe posse on the wall and I put a K behind it, that means I'm a horseshoe posse killer. Those same letters, nicknames, and symbols show up in the gang's ink. That's how we identify members that don't know their name, and we identify them by their street name uh, relative to their tattoos. One popular stamp incorporates the most famous symbol of St. Louis. They may have the arch tattooed on their arm and then have numbers on one side of the, of the arch legs. I feel like this, man, either respect it or check it, dog. You hear me? Got the no. man, f the police. Rico's tattoos reflect a life filled with bloodshed. My cousin died in 05 in Baton on the north side of St. Louis. Got two shots to the head. This is his big brother. He got killed in 07. The gang also represents with hand signals. This is a B, O, and the D. Stacking. That's what they used to call it, stacking. They used to have little dances with it and stuff. In the 314, even the lid you wear means something. The BODs represent with the St. Louis Blues gear. The Horseshoe Posse wear the Indianapolis Colts gear. That's the old traditional way of, of doing things. Like our hats identify our neighborhood. All the players know what this hat means. In the 1990s, wearing the wrong hat in the BOD's hood was putting your life on the line. Psych learned that lesson the hard way. We on our way to see these girls down in the BOD neighborhood. We get jacked for the damn hats, man. By the damn BODs. Psych quickly retaliated, grabbing a gun and hunting down his attackers. And they knew it was me. I used to wear a red ski mask. I had a low rider, gray low rider. I used to wear a red ski mask, drive around her. Psych won't reveal what happened, but he admits that the BODs took revenge, ambushing him outside the horseshoe. Psych was pinned in with no escape. And I'm backed up in traffic, dropping this damn girl off. And uh, some cats run out this alley. The BODs run out this alley. Man, they try to gun my car up, man. The BODs opened fire, but Sight managed to get away. Sight gives credit to his attackers, whom he suspects he knows. It was a perfect plot. I give it to him. It was, it was real strategic of him. Whoever put that down, I think that was Rainbow. We had our differences. They click shooting at each other. People from our click shooting at each other. People being rivals is, is no telling what. One would go to the extent to do to get rid of the other. That was especially true when it came to Dorsey, whose main mission was maintaining his power. It's like drive by every night, nonstop. That was it. Fall 1991. The Boys of Destruction, the BODs, were the most feared gang in St. Louis, thanks to their charismatic leader, Dorsey Brandon. He was very smart. You know, he was a hustler and uh, very manipulative. He uh, would cause havoc on the street with other rival gang members. Dorsey had narrowly survived seven bullets to the chest. He believed at the hands of his arch rival, the Horseshoe Posse. 
and he was supposed to be on the, what they considered the low low. Dorsey wasn't about to lay low. He needed to restore his reputation as the toughest gangster in Hustle City. October 30th. Dorsey had been back out on the streets for two weeks when he went to the Rose Lounge, a popular nightclub. The usual just go up there, have some drinks, mess with ladies, and pretty much the typical street thing. The nightclub bordered Horseshoe Posse territory. Rival gang members would come because it's set on the uh, perimeter of Dorsey's neighborhood and right on the boundary line of uh, other gang uh, infested areas also. Rainbow can't say just how it began. Old secrets die hard. But someone started trouble with one of Dorsey's friends. The BOD's leader wasn't going to stand for that kind of disrespect. He got into it with somebody for his associates, his friends. You know, they got into it with somebody in the club. Dorsey was outside the club when a truck drove up and someone fired off two rounds. He ended up shooting Dorsey. He pretty much just opened all his other wounds up and he pretty much just suffocated. He couldn't breathe. He just, he just ran out of air. He died a tragic death, you know. He, he died by the same, the same things that he practiced on the street. I was able to respond to that, that, that shooting, that scene. And when he died, he had like a smile on his face. Dorsey was only 18 years old. News of his murder quickly spread through the Gateway City. After his death, a lot of RIPs remember Dorsey and P's. Uh, a lot of BODs where you would see RIP Dorsey, Boys of Destruction. He was good to us, but he was bad to everybody else, put it like that. So everybody else didn't like him, but we loved him. He loved us. BOD went on the warpath to avenge their fallen leader. For weeks afterward, the gang and their horseshoe posse rivals carried on the most violent street war St. Louis had ever seen. Yes, the city was in chaos. Uh, it was crazy. Uh, for real. And when that happened, it was going hard, but for us, revenge trip, but it, it lingered. People started going to jail. People started getting killed, you know. The homicide rate skyrocketed with the gang violence in 93. We had the highest homicide, highest murder rate. That year, the number of murders jumped to 267, a record for St. Louis. Rainbow, now 16 years old, tried to take his brother's place as the BOD leader. After the things that happened to my brother, and, you know, they kind of put myself out there, really made me focus on, more in on my, the foes, and I wanted vengeance. Rainbow was tough, but didn't have his brother's fierce charisma. He started establishing this, how they say, collect his own bones. But he was not Darcy. He didn't carry that weight that Darcy had of viciousness and everything else, or leadership. In 1995, authorities caught up with Rainbow, arresting him on drugs and weapons charges. He was sentenced to seven years behind bars. With Dorsey dead and Rainbow in prison, the BODs were shaken to the core. But their rivalry with the Horseshoe Posse was as strong as ever, and killings were becoming everyday events. Piper took over leadership of the BODs and struggled to keep the gang together. Whatever you establish, you're gonna make sure you got mind, you're gonna make sure you got muscle. So you're gonna make sure that everybody, everybody's took care of. But Piper found himself in the crosshairs. 
In 1999, he was hanging out with friends outside a local garage when a rival gang member walked straight up to him and opened fire. I started to run. He hit me in the back, in my lower back. I'm just laying there stuck, bleeding. Can't move because everything from the waist down had died. The guy stood over me, but he didn't kill me. So I was thankful for that. Piper was paralyzed from the waist down. But even today, won't give up the shooter. Because in the streets, he don't tell. Even though I heard about who did, I'd still never say nothing about it. Piper spent the next year learning how to walk again. But his injuries did nothing to slow down his gangbanging. I was cooking up drugs in my wheelchair. I kind of got worse in the streets. I started selling more dope. I started doing more things. Everything that I did before, I did more because I felt like at any time I could lose it. Piper was hanging tough. But the gang was under assault from all sides. Several other members, elite guys, were killed. And then the police were very effective in getting rid of the rest through law enforcement matter, you know, getting cases, sending them to prison. As rival gangs muscled in on the BOD's turf, anarchy became the norm. By 2000, there was a new creed in the hood. Anywhere, anyone, anytime. Anybody can get it. They'll kill anybody. They don't care who it is. You can look at a person wrong, and if it's that just that wrong person, it shoots you. The Boys of Destruction were a headless snake with no real leader. And the St. Louis gang war was increasingly chaotic and violent. Back in our day, me and Dorsey, them day, you have respect. They're on another level nowadays. These little guys, they don't care. By 2005, after serving five years in prison for weapons and drug violations, Rainbow was free and back on the street. He tried to go legit, but trouble seemed to find him. That November, Rainbow was pulled over by a cop on a routine traffic stop. My record's never been wiped clean. So when he ran my name, he came back. He was real jumpy. This man really was jittery and jumpy with me. And I feel I had to protect myself. Got to tussling and fighting. And you know, he got to going for his gun. I wasn't finna let him get his gun. Rainbow severely beat the officer. Stopping only when he was physically pulled off the cop. Rainbow fled and was on the lam for two days before turning himself in. He was sentenced to another 15 years in prison for assaulting a police officer. Today, the long-standing rivalry between the BODs and Horseshoe Posse is changing. Though the BODs still sometimes represent with the color blue, both gangs have severed their ties with the L.A. gangs. Every culture have its changed. People gravitate to a certain thing. But I look back on it now, it's a bunch of, oh, that was stupid. That was just the way of life, man. Instead of shooting it out, they play by new rules. Red and blue make green. He makes money, I'm making money. We on the same page, we gonna click up. You might do see a BOD or a horseshoe doing business. I mean, their favorite color might be red or blue, but they love green. Money. Rule of all the evil. The gangs that now work together to deal drugs are also coming together to use. Guys, it's on the dog food. They pretty much respect each other when they see each other at the heroin house because they need to get a fix. Now, if they kiss each other later on around the block, then it's probably be a different story. A lot of guys who can be shooting at each other during the day, they may be sharing the same needle at night. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. You see them on the same street. One of them got a blue bandana on his head. One of them got a red bandana on his head. They stand out drinking and getting high. So it can't be about, it can't be about the red and blue. 
The breakdown of the old rivalry means the streets are even more chaotic. The new generation of BODs roll with no conscience. This cutthroat is crazy. It's is war zone. As St. Louis works to rebuild its old neighborhoods, BOD territories are disappearing. I remember when, like that whole corner was street was full of houses. You can imagine how many people's out here. The Jordan was bought up. See the vacant lots. The battle lines are being redrawn with a vengeance. I understand that even though they may be uh, losing their identity, they're still out there. Young people doing shootings and killing each other. The gang members here, you know, as far as loyalty is concerned, it doesn't go deep at all. There have been incidents uh, where we believe that fellow gang members have killed each other. Piper often visits his old neighborhood and with the help of a federal probation program, is trying to stay sober and complete job training. I don't feel bad about the stuff I did. I just, I hate it that I, now that I'm older, when I see what I did selling drugs, it was hurting my own people, I understand that now. But at the time, it was just survival. It's an uphill battle. And a lot of these guys, since they've never worked legitimate jobs, they don't understand that type of uh, commitment. Their commitment is live fast and die young. Piper is no longer active, but says he'll always be a BOD, though he's critical of the new generation. Still got the younger guy that pretty much called himself boys of destruction, but they don't really have no respect for nothing. Rainbow also says he'll be a BOD as long as he lives, though his days behind bars have given him plenty of time to think. At the end of the day, you know, you done lost your loved ones, you know, someone you known, and really shouldn't have went like that, where you can't rewind no bullets or nothing like that. Rico says being a BOD is a birthright that he can't escape. And I say, that's not where I'm from, or that's not my hood. That's like saying, uh, my brother's not my brother. Well, my family, not my family. It's like this only your last name, almost. But he's decided to leave the old hood behind. In 2007, he moved to a north side neighborhood, a place his mother hoped would keep him away from gang violence. She was wrong. My first week living over here was five murders within seven days. And about a mile radius from that corner to this end. Right in this area, we, so we put right in the hot zone over here. That's what, exactly where we move, right in the middle of it. Rico has decided to get a day job and is trying to stay straight. But temptation and risk are everywhere. This particular night, his new neighbors are keeping an eye on Rico and his BOD brothers. Yeah, I see somebody driving by. They he rolled by about five times since we've been sitting up here. Gotta keep it up, boy. Where them guys at, man? Watching for the man. We gotta be easy out here, boy. Stay on them tip tops. Yeah, these try to catch you, yeah, to catch you slipping. It's been this way in the hustle city for decades. And there's no sign that the bloodshed is slowing. Well, the gang activity in St. Louis is fluid and there's you might say it's just as fluid as the Mississippi River we're located next to. It's a situation that's constantly changing and constantly evolving. Um, the gangs are always lethal. You should never, ever play them cheap. It, it's a noticeable difference. The feel of it. I mean, this, I guess they just doing it for nothing now. Like now, they don't do it for the neighborhood. It's not really a neighborhood thing. It ain't about the gripping blood. It's more now, they just getting high and shooting. That's all they do is make money to buy bullets and guns. It's going to be way worse than it is now. I, I, my advice to the parents is to get life insurance on all your kids. And that's sad to say, but it's true.